Recently, I went on vacation, and I was down in Tennessee, and I stopped at a flea market, and I bought something. Before I show you what it is, I want to read you something. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 13 through 15. The Bible says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed or changed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their work. What did God's Word just tell us? God's Word told us that the angels, A.R., the devil sometimes transforms himself as an angel of light. Amen? So sometimes things look good and they look right and they really aren't, are not because they belong to the enemy. Sometimes he takes you in the wrong direction. Anybody ever seen that in your life before? I have. Sometimes it looks real good, and sometimes they even cover it by Scripture. And I didn't know this, but on this thing, it's got 316. Well, 316 is for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. So the devil, sometimes he even uses Scripture. And I bought this thing, and I thought it was kind of unique. You know, you see something sometimes, and you won't. What you see, and this thing comes with some instructions. Also comes with a home charger and a car charger. That's a wonderful little tool here. It's a flashlight. So when you got a flashlight, you know, you need that light. Shine your way through the darkness. But what did we just say? Sometimes the devil transforms himself into an angel of light. Yeah. Brother Darrell, come on over here. You can get this good now. Now this is a nice little flashlight, right? <laughs> That's one million votes. One million votes. It looked harmless, didn't it? Looked like a little light that everybody ought to have. I mean, it's just a little light, Mike. About Matt. I don't know why I'm calling you Mike. A little light, you know. To light up your life. But this thing will light you up. <laughs> In police, Brother Tony, we call it what? Riding the lightning. You don't want to ride the lightning. Let me tell you something. But the enemy, he will always come. And he never just comes as, a, as someone who's got horns and a forked tail. And you just realize, well, that's the devil. It doesn't come that way. Sometimes, as I often say, he comes dressed in blue jeans with blue eyes. See, the enemy's always going to be there, and he's always going to be deceptive, and he's always going to try to lead you down the wrong road. I want you to turn with me this morning to James chapter 4, and we're going to look at verse 7, 8, 9, and 10. I'm going to give you a lot of scripture today. But I want you to follow because if you don't follow this principle in your life, the enemy is going to be able to come in and deceive you. The Bible says the gates of hell shall not prevail against the mighty church of the living God. The enemy cannot win when you, amen, live under God's word and God's grace and God's mercy. When you pattern your life according to what God has given you, in his word, you will be able to defeat the enemy in every situation. The Bible says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. To God. So first and foremost, you've got to be submitted to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So first thing is what? Submit. Next thing is to resist the devil. So you got to submit and commit to God, resist the devil, and defeat him. Word of God says, amen, that if we draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to us, or you. The closer you walk toward God, 
the closer God walks toward you. Now, do you understand? That's not hard to understand, right? If we both, amen, me and Brother Charles started walking towards each other, we'd meet in the middle somewhere. And then that's what God says. He says, come, let us reason together. Doesn't he say that? Though your sins be, you know, like scarlet, we'll reason together. And I'll make them white as snow because I'll forgive you because my son died for your sins and he will forgive you. I will look through his eyes and no longer see you as unrighteous, but I will see you as righteous in my son. Amen. See, we don't get close to God many times. We stray from God. The prodigal son did that, didn't he? The Bible says he took what his father had and he ran as fast as he could. And the Bible didn't say he went to the city that was next to the city he was in. The Bible said he went far away from the father. He traveled many, many, many miles to get away from the father. And see, the father never left where he was at. The son had to leave the pig pen that he found himself in, and then he had to remember that in his father's house, the very servants were living better than he was. The Bible said he would have filled himself with the husk that the pigs were eating, but the owners of the pigs wouldn't even give him that. But his father was willing to give him everything, his blessing, his inheritance, what he didn't deserve, he would have got. But anyway, when he started traveling back from the far country, what happened? The father looked down that dusty road like he did every day before, and he seen that son coming back home. The Bible says that he ran to his son. In Jewish customs, you don't run if you're a Jewish man. But he picked up his robe, tucked it into his belt, and ran to his son. The Bible said he fell on his neck, hugged him, got him a pair of shoes, got him a ring, and said, kill the fatted calf, we're going to celebrate. My son that was dead is alive. My son that was lost is found. Amen. But God never left where he was. The son had to leave where he was. So I'm telling you this morning, God is not going to come to your mess. You got to get out of your mess and come to God. Now you didn't hear me. I got to say it again. God is not coming to your mess. You got to leave the mess and come to God. So many times we're, we're saying, God bless our mess. God is not going to bless your mess. You created your mess. You have to leave the mess, go back to God, and ask for God to forgive you. The son said, I'm going back, and I'm going to tell my father I'm not fit to be a son. Just let me be one of the servants, because I know at least as a servant I'll, I'll get to eat. But the father interrupted his conversation before he could even say, let me be the servant. The father said, this is my son. You don't lose out with God because you get yourself in a mess. You lose out with God because you don't leave the mess. That's when you lose out with God. As long as he would have remained in that pig pen, he would have remained in that mess. But God wants you to leave your mess, amen, and cling to his best. But you're going to have to submit yourself to God. You're going to have to walk toward God. The Bible says, cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. James chapter 1, verse 7 and 8 says, for let not that man, let not that man, amen, think that he's going to receive anything of the Lord. Verse 8 says, because a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. See, a double-minded man is someone like many people in this church. One moment you won't believe God, next moment you don't believe God at all. The one moment you said, yeah, God is going to do this, the next moment said, I don't even know where God's at. That's double-mindedness. That's not true faith. Faith is looking at everything in spite of all the circumstances and all the situations. You still believe God because you know God can do the impossible. Amen. God created everything. He holds everything in place just with his word. 
And your words are valuable. The Bible says there's life and death in the very words you speak. So when you wake up and call your children little devils, guess what? That's what they're going to turn out to be, little devils. You ought to bless your children. You ought to bless one another. That's what God wants you to do. See, if you're unstable in all your ways, you're never going to be walking in the way of the Lord. There's people that call me, amen, on a constant basis. But do you really want help? Are you just looking for somebody to just say, okay, you're justified in your mess? You call them the wrong person if you want me to say that because I'm not saying it. There is always an answer for every situation. There is always something you can do to correct the mess you have caused. See, some of us think, no, we haven't caused that mess. Yes, you have. One way or another, the mess has been caused. Either you didn't submit yourself to God and resist the devil and you allowed him to come into your home. You allowed him to destroy your family. You've allowed him to take over your children's lives or whatever. There's always circumstances there that you can trace back to yourself. So you might say, I didn't do a thing, Pastor. I, I, I was a good mom and I was a good daddy or whatever the case may be. But did you pray? Did you start your day off with prayer? Did you tell your children that you loved them? Did you tell your children when they messed up that you were going to correct them? Did you tell your children that they weren't going to get away with everything? Amen. You were going to give them what they needed, not what they wanted. See, today in our society, we think, well, handouts are great. Everybody ought to get everything free. Let me tell you something. There is nothing free. There's a cost and a value put on everything. Nothing is free. Somebody said, well, thank God salvation's free. No, salvation is not free. It costs Jesus Christ his life. It costs God his only begotten son. It was not free. Free. It was a precious price, uh, amen, that was paid for sinners uh, who deserved a devil's hell. Uh, but the Lord said, I'm going to die and I'm going to take their sins from them. If they'll accept me, amen, I will forgive them. There's a price. There's a price. Oh, it's wonderful if, if we hear these lying politicians say, we're going to give you free college, we're going to give you free this, we're going to give you free that. Nothing is free. Call somebody. Yeah. See, when I had to pay that over $7,000, I went back to the tax man, Brother Charles. I said, Brother, I barely left your office till the IRS pulled that money out of my account. He said, really? I said, no, but it was just about that quick. But Brother Jeremy, it was free. Somebody took that money and got it free. Otherwise, we wouldn't be so indebted as a nation. Yeah. We're indebted, amen, as a nation because we expected things to be free. Nothing is free. And for you to live for God, you're going to have to sacrifice some things. When Jesus told the rich young ruler, sell all you have, uh, take up your cross and follow me, uh, he meant exactly what he said. The rich young ruler said, I can't do that. Uh, you're asking too much of me. And the Bible says he walked away sorrowful. Uh, but then we read about a rich man that lifted up his eyes in hell uh, in torment uh, because he never wanted to serve God. And then he wanted somebody to go back and tell his brother, Others, don't come to this place too late too little see we need to submit ourselves to God and this double minded situation we find ourselves in many times is from the enemy yes. James chapter 4 verse 9 says be afflicted and mourn and weep let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Who's going to lift you up? God's going to lift you up. This individual finds himself uh, afflicted. He finds himself mourning. He finds himself weeping. Uh, but the Bible says, uh, amen, let your laughter be turned to mourning uh, and your joy to heaviness uh, because God uh, is going to lift you up. Uh, the Bible says uh, he'll give you beauty for ashes. Uh, he'll take that garment of heaviness uh, and give you a praise, amen, uh, that looks like a glorious robe. Uh, he will place it upon you so you can praise God. God, in the midst of your trial, in the midst of your situation, in the midst of your circumstances, God is still God. 
Hallelujah. Amen. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 through 19. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward, who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. What is that exceeding power? What is that power that will enable us to do, uh, amen, far above what we're able to ask or think? Uh, the Bible says it's the power of God that works in your life. The power of God. See, it's not by your power, it's not by your might, but it's by His Spirit, the Word of God says. God's Spirit being upon you. Samson in his own muscular facet could not do anything. Amen. He could not take the gates of a city and chase the enemies. The Bible says when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, then he could do his mighty things for God. Hallelujah. Your muscles can't do anything. Your might can't do nothing. I mean, you might do a few little things, but you're not going to do no mighty things. See, we need to realize that God gives us that anointing. God gives us that power, that same power that raises people from the dead, that same power that pulls people out of wheelchairs, that same power that takes cancer and kills it and drives it from the body, that same power, amen, that God has given us who believe. I can think of a whole lot of things, and I can believe God for many things. But see, we talk a good game, but sometimes we say what we believe, and then we say something different than what we just said. Do you hear what I said? We get that double-mindedness. And God hears every word we say. And we stand accountable for every word we say. It's not, amen, just, just getting up and blabbing and grabbing. It's getting up and believing. And believing when you don't see it. Believing when everything seems to be coming against what you're believing. You still believe. See, when I've had those situations in my life, I believe God, amen, no matter what. We believe God. Amen. So believe God in every situation. Believe God that God's able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you're able to ask or think according to the power that works in you. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 20 and 23 goes on to say, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principalities and powers and mights and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 through 18, finally my brethren be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles which simply means trickery deceit and schemes of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand or resist in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand. Having done everything you know, to do, you continue to stand. And the Bible says, stand therefore, having your lawns girded about with the truth. The truth is the word of the living God. The truth is what makes you free. And having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench or put out all the fiery darts or missiles, arrows, javelins, darts, all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation amen and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God praying always 
with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplications for all saints. That's what gets you victory. See, when he tells you about taking the armor of God, when he tells you about what he's made available to you as a child of God, when he tells you to equip yourself uh, and you're going to fight this battle, but you're going to win the battle because you're going to keep your focus upon the captain of your salvation. The Bible says keep your eyes, uh, amen, on Jesus Christ, uh, the captain of your salvation. Uh, if you want faith, amen, you got to read the word of God because faith cometh by hearing uh, and hearing by the word of God. Uh, if I'm going to read it, I'm going to read it out loud. I want to hear it. Not in my mind. I want to hear it in my spirit. Amen. I want to hear it in my ears. I want to know that God has given me this word. And this word has given me victory through Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Yeah, hallelujah. I see people struggling all the time. And many times it's needless struggle. See, sometimes you need to take action. You need to take action. You know, sometimes you, you talk to parents, and, 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 and I've talked to some here in this church, and say, I can't handle this one anymore, and I want to send this one to their dad. And I said, go ahead, maybe the dad can handle it. You know, so when the dad sometimes is giving them what you don't want them to have, then just let the dad have what you don't want to have yourself, a rebellious child. Amen? Divorce is horrible. It's not a good thing. It's never good on the children. It's never good on you. It's like a death. But if it happens, you don't give up. You get up, get fixed up, control your life, submit yourself to God, commit your ways to the Lord. You don't think about what you're going to do. You don't lean to your own understanding, but in all your ways you acknowledge Him and allow Him to direct your path. He's not going to direct you to some bar to get another old man, a man, to become your husband uh, so you can try to straighten him out. Amen. Some of you had to, you've married four times, you've had the same one all four times. Oh, they look different, but they're the same person. <laughs> same one, same one. You married the first drunk, you couldn't fix them, so you married the second drunk. You couldn't fix them, so you married the third drunk. Couldn't fix them, so you married the fourth drunk. You didn't fix them either. Because you can't fix them. Only God can fix somebody. Amen. And people are so busy trying to fix somebody. That's why you need to pray. Always, the Bible says, pray. Always, amen. You ought to have a prayer in your heart and your mouth uh, on a continual basis. Uh, I don't care what the devil's doing in your home. God is greater than the devil. Uh, God is greater. Can somebody say amen? Uh, my dad was a rascal, but my mom stayed, uh, amen, in the grace of God. Uh, she stayed, amen, I believe in the face of God, amen, crying out for a husband who was rebellious, for a husband who was drunk, finally, before he died, he gave his life to Christ, never give up, you don't know when it's going to come, but I believe that God honors the prayer of every person when that prayer is faithful. Field. Amen. And they've committed and submitted themselves to God. God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all you're able to ask or think according to the power that works within you. Amen. Hallelujah. 1 Peter 5, 6 and 9 says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that you may that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your cares or anxiety upon him. How many people you know today that's on Xanax or some other type of anxiety medication? The Bible says right here, casting all your anxiety upon him for he careth for you. Be sober. How many you know that drink to try to get some peace? Now the Bible says be sober because you're going to have to be vigilant. I mean, those drunk people ain't, ain't vigilant. Drunk people get beat up. Drunk people get run over and run over other people. Drunk people can't control their life. When you get drunk, you're the, you're the biggest man in the world. I don't care if you stand four foot three. You're, all, you're the biggest man in the world, toughest man in the world, until somebody beats you down. Huh? 
See, but you got to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, you got an adversary. He's called the devil as a roaring lion, as a roaring lion. He's not a roaring lion. He's as a roaring lion. Walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast or firmly in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished or imposed upon in your brethren that are in the world. You know, you're not the first one that fought this battle. Yeah. Some of you probably think the battle you're going through, the first person in history that's ever fought that battle. Oh, Brother Walls, you don't understand. You just don't understand. No, I might not have ever fought the battle, but somebody before you fought that battle. And somebody before you won that battle. And they won that battle because they submitted themselves to God. They won that battle because they kept the faith. They stayed committed to the Lord. Can somebody say amen? Because James 1, 7, 8, here is again, a double-minded minded man is unstable in all his ways and cannot expect to receive anything from the Lord. Uh, Ephesians 5, 1 through 13. Uh, be ye therefore imitators or followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling Savior but fornication now listen up closely. But fornication and all uncleanliness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Don't let it be named one time among you. Not a hundred times, not one time. Because it's not befitting for believers. You know what this is. You don't have to be taught what fornication is. It's sex outside of marriage. Uncleanliness. You know what that is. Covetousness. That's wanting something.